Good morning, if it is also 7 a.m. for you right now. I'm trying this new thing where I wake up a little bit early and I film before I have to go to work uh, to try and tweak my little creation schedule. You know, whatever works is whatever works. <laughs> And usually I'm really not a morning person, but for some reason <laughs> getting out of my bed to turn on the camera and talk about books was not such a bad thing. So this might be, this might be a thing that we do now. Hopefully the glare from my glasses won't be too bad. Um, if it is, I'm really sorry about it, but um, it's part of the outfit. So it's just what you get today. <laughs> We're doing a really fun video today, which I, I don't feel like I often tow outside the lines of the classic bread and butter kind of TBR wrap up announcements <laughs> kind of videos, or at least I haven't in the last few months, I've been kind of on like survival content mode, <laughs> but I'd really like to get back into feeling more creative and, and doing videos outside of those like bread and butter <laughs> templates. And while I'm definitely not the person that invented the, if you like this, you might also like this kind of video. Um, it's the first time that I have done one on my channel. So you're gonna get the Noel Seven Pages classic. <laughs> what I decided to do, which I think is kind of the norm for these videos is choose a more hyped, well-known book. And if you liked that book, I've chosen one that I think you might also like that has like similar vibes or similar tropes, similar setting, whatever. And there is a mix of YA and adult in here. So, you know, we read it all and we appreciate it all. The first one I'm gonna talk about is Strange the Dreamer by Lainey Taylor, which I really loved this book. This book was a five star read for me. I hated the second book, but we don't have to talk about that. In my brain, Strange the Dreamer is just a, it's just a standalone and, and I'm happy living in that fantasy. If you liked Strange the Dreamer, I think that you would also like The Kingdom of Back by Marie Lu. Here's my reasoning. They both have this huge focus and a lot of the key story important stuff happens in dreams. Not really gonna say more than that, but dreams are like a big part of both of these books. They both have very light, whimsical magic that really sweeps you away. There's this very quiet, like breadcrumb mystery, almost like cozy mystery, except Strange the Dreamer, it's really intense at the end. And you know what? Kingdom of Back, it gets a little intense at the end. So in that way, they're still pretty similar. In my notes, I have chill yet powerful romance. And that's like 100% it, because in both books, there's a lot else going on, but something that is constantly driving the story and the characters is this like tense, um, crush romance situation. And then they also both deal with um, family trauma and growing up, you know, kind of this like coming of age story in a way. Um, Kingdom of Back a little bit more so than Strange the Dreamer, but um, Laszlo Strange and Strange the Dreamer has to leave his isolated place of comfort, even though he wasn't actually treated super well, uh, but he leaves to go on this great adventure and great quest and discover his own strengths and his own joys and abilities and what he wants to do with his life. And in the Kingdom of Back, you follow the fictionalized imagined life of Mozart's sister, Nannerl Mozart, who is also a musician. And in this time period, women and girls are not supposed to be musicians. <laughs> At least not to the great fame and credit that her brother was, and they are definitely not supposed to write their own music. So she deals a lot with those family expectations and growing up and standing up for herself and discovering like, using her voice in more ways than one and also what she wants to do and, and how she wants to move through her life after growing up with this prodigy brother, even though she is just as good musically as he is. My next little matchup, you're gonna laugh, <laughs> but I have, if you liked Addie LaRue, you might also like The Library of Legends, which even though Addie LaRue was really not my favorite, there were a lot that I, could still appreciate about it. And this book was similar. I definitely liked Library of Legends more than I liked Addie LaRue, but it's still, I still gave this a four stars. And, and so I think maybe if you loved, loved Addie LaRue, I do see so many similarities that this might, you might actually like this even more than I did. In both cases, uh, we follow a quiet kind of solitary, main female protagonist who is learning to use her voice and learning to navigate her world. 
in both cases, uh, more so in Addie LaRue and a little bit more uh, focused in this one, we go through key historical moments in time. In the case of Library of Legends, it takes place in 1937 when the Japanese start dropping bombs on China and then forces these students to kind of migrate mm, deeper west into China and away from the more eastern like coastal areas I suppose and in Addie LaRue it spans like literally centuries and she finds all kinds of different people and, and experiences over the centuries. Both of them have elements of soft magic or magical realism you could say and both of them rely heavily on myth and legend to drive the story and keep the mystery alive and question what is real, what isn't real, is the character imagining that, what's actually going on, does that character have powers, like just kind of keeps you guessing where where the magic and where the legends are. This is also in my notes, um, both of them have a very vivid and historical well-researched setting, which I don't know how I feel about saying that about Addie LaRue because I don't know how well researched it actually was. She refers to Swiss being a language like four or five times, which Swiss is not a language. Um, however, in the Library of Legends, the research was very, very well done, but not in like a dry, um, dense historical fiction way. If that's turning you off of this book, I promise it's not dry and dense. It's just kind of quiet and slow which is exactly how I felt about Addie LaRue also. There's a lot of superstition going on in both. There's a lot of will they, won't they yearning that's happening in both. Um, in Library of Legends, uh, because we know that Addie LaRue is about a girl who chooses to accidentally become immortal and then complains the whole book about being immortal. In Library of Legends, we follow our main character, who is a student at this university that finds itself under siege from Japanese bombs. So all of the students at this university carry one special book with them from this fabled, famous Library of Legends, which is said to be this great collection of volumes of books that tell the story of all of China's myths and legends. And so each student carries one book with them as they evacuate deeper into China and to try and find a safe house or a safe spot away from where their university is being bombed. And because they're all so, so deeply close to these books now and these legends now, and they each have one volume that they're like reading along the way and they're talking to each other along the way, myths and legends become very, very important and very prevalent. And then they start to notice things happening as they go through their journey. And I won't tell you much more than that, but it is a really, really interesting and beautiful book. And I had a great time more great than I had with Adil Rue, but again, I'm, I'm not gonna keep beating that dead horse. Oh, okay, on a little bit of a lighter note now, I have, if you liked The House in the Cerulean Sea, you might also like Molly Moon's Incredible Book of Hypnotism by Georgia Bing, which this is like <laughs> one of my favorite books of all time. You can see I've had this copy for probably 20, 15 years maybe, and um, my parents' cats like chewed this up at one point. <laughs> The spine is like peeling. So this is a treasure. This is a more recent treasure and they are very similar. Let me explain. Both focus on these quote unquote magical or uh, supernaturally talented orphans that are learning to harness their skills and step into their power. There's this very whimsical, colorful nature to both of these books, just kind of larger than life, but still super, super wholesome and, and just feels like the warm fuzzies. It just feels like a big hug reading both of these. Both of them I feel are coming of age stories, but not in the usual way. Both of them do things very differently and a, a really unique style. There's really strong friendships between the kids. I mean, this is, I guess, adult, but feels like middle grade. <laughs> this is middle grade, but reads really well for adults like me. I have reread this at least five times in my adult life and probably a dozen times <laughs> before I was an adult. And um, it still holds up and it, it's still a great, great read every time. So both of them have that like depth to them as far as like uh, reading books from children's perspective goes. I love the friendships in both and both just really take you for such a fun ride, but there's such a good like lesson and meaning 
to them at the same time. Both of them I was completely unable to put down, even though The House in the Cerulean Sea I've only read once. I think I read it in like maybe two sittings. And every time I pick up Molly Moon again, I just can't put it down. It's, it's like a one sitter every single time for me. And admittedly, I do have a lot of attachment and nostalgia to this book, but I, I do think you'd still enjoy it even without the attachment and nostalgia. And I just am so amazed that I don't hear Molly Moon talked about as often as I would love, probably because it's very backlisted. Again, this is like probably 15 years old. <laughs> when was this published? 2002? So, so 20, 20 years. No. 20 years? Anyways, read Molly Moon because this, this is now, that's like entering modern classics territory. Okay, maybe that's dramatic, but I, I love this book. Also, both of them are vaguely a mystery and you're kind of swept away in like the kids and their magic and their adventures until like the last 30% and then it's like a whole ass mystery on the edge of your seat un until you finish it. It's like very unput downable right at the end for both. The House in the Cerulean Sea is a little bit hard to explain, but I feel like I feel like we all kind of have the gist at this point, even if you haven't read it, but it follows these magical kids of varying <laughs> degrees of magic, varying powers, and they live in this orphanage at the very edge of the ocean. And then our protagonist is this man in his like late 30s, early 40s, who has this very, very boring, very dry desk job um, related to like basically compliance of all of these orphanages that take care of magical kids. And so he gets put on this assignment to go visit this orphanage and make sure that everything is a-okay and they're treating these kids okay. Um, and then all kinds of uh, mischief and wholesome things happen during his trip out there. Molly Moon's Incredible Book of Hypnotism, uh, you may be able to guess through context clues, but we follow this young orphan, I think she's 11 or 12 at the start of the book, and uh, she lives in England and she finds this book about hypnotism uh, after a, a couple of really hard knocks <laughs> in her in her life the last few weeks when the story starts and she teaches herself hypnotism and hypnotizes her way into leaving the orphanage leaving england uh finding this ritzy fancy apartment in new york city and doing all kinds of like larger than life shenanigans before things start to catch up with her. And it is so much fun. It is such a hoot. And there's a whole series after it if you decide that you like Molly Moon. So join the party. Next is, if you liked the selection, I think you might also like The Wrath and the Dawn by Renee Audier, which this is not super underhyped. I mean, I think TikTok found this recently, but between the selection and this one, I definitely think that The Wrath and the, Do and the Dawn, The Wrath and the Dawn, <laughs> has less fans. Both of them feature royalty seeking a spouse uh, over many, many options. <laughs> Both of them have this underlying theme of challenging the power dynamic, especially by the suitors of the royal person. Both of them have a super spunky, uh, sassy main character. I, I love them both, but I really, really love our main character in Wrath and the Dawn. The Wrath and the Dawn. Why can't I say that today? And also both of them have very low key political subtext. It's definitely more in this one where in the, <laughs> the selection series, especially on my reread two years ago, it just, it just felt very surface level, but it was there. There is like, there is an attempt at political subtext and The Wrath and the Dawn. It's a retelling of the 1001 Nights and our main character is a, a new spin on Scheherazade. She is chosen to be the possible next suitor for the Caliph who is known for taking one wife every single night and then killing her. It's just this endless stream of suitors that he marries and then murders. And so she decides, well, she will tell him a story but not finish the story so that he won't kill her the next day because he wants to hear the rest of the story. Like that's the, that's the legend of Scheherazade um, and kind of carries over into the retelling and it's so good. Honestly, the selection pales in comparison to this and that's my hot take. These next ones I'm really excited about because I think, 
I think it <laughs> very much so highlights my specific reading taste. I have, um, if you enjoyed A Special Place for Women, I think that you would also enjoy The Atmospherians by Isle McElroy. And both of them are so much fun. I gave A Special Place for Women three stars. And the Atmospherians, I think I gave up a resounding five stars because it was so strange and so funny and so profound in like all the best ways. Both of them deal with uh, cults in the case of Atmospherians. In the case of uh, Special Place for Women, it's a little bit culty and also like this secret society and both of them have a heavy dose of like woo woo spiritual shit going on. In A Special Place for Women, it's more like tarot and astrology. And in The Atmospherians, it's more like satirical uh, and stereotypical cult stuff. <laughs> Both of them tell the story through a lot of humor and satire, which is something that I've discovered I really, really enjoy being able to learn what a book is trying to say through its use of humor. Huge fan of that. And I think The Atmospherians does that super, super well. A Special Place for Women has a lot of really good lines and like single quips, but there's there's this excellent overlay of satire in the Atmospherians. There's this message of self-awareness, even for like toxic people or people who know that they are problematic trying to fix themselves and heal and learn and grow. And also women getting the best of toxic men. So A Special Place for Women follows this young journalist who's kind of down on her luck and for this kind of Hail Mary, save her career idea, she decides she wants to infiltrate this um, open secret, like secret society called Nevertheless. And so she's like, if only I can get an invitation and be initiated into it, then I can go undercover and expose them. It's kind of this constant give and take of, is it just this group of wealthy white women drawing tarot cards and having this like hashtag girl boss feminism um, echo chamber? Or is there something weird and sinister, possibly even dangerous going on? And is fun. I loved the way that spirituality was talked in this book. And I loved kind of the, the wackadoo way that it ends. Uh, really, really just in a whole, a whole different place than I thought we were going, which is kind of the charm of it. And then with the Atmospherians, um, this is about a, a canceled influencer who pairs up with her like washed up actor best friend and they decide that they're gonna start a cult together to reform toxic problematic men. And it's so funny and it's so good and I loved it so much and I can't wait for Ayo McElroy to just keep writing books because I will read anything and everything that they publish. I'm obsessed and this was, this was like way too good for its own good. And the paperback is out now, but I love the original hardback because it has this like Instagram cover to it which is great um, and huge fan. Anyways, you should read it. It deserves more love. Ayo McElroy is just like a gem of a person and, and I love him. I gotta hurry my ass up because I still have to go get to work, which, which is the downside of filming in the morning is that I have a, a time crunch. <laughs> my next pairing is if you liked The Nightingale, you already know it's coming. I think, I think that you would also like The Rose Code. <laughs> Who's surprised? No one is surprised. <laughs> the Nightingale is a female spy. The Rose Code is um, women working on this secret intelligence base. Both of them have strong and complex and flawed and nuanced female friendships. Both of them deeply pass the Bechdel test. <laughs> Both of them uh, are World War II historical fiction novels and are both based on like actual people and actual places. Um, this follows the Nightingale, who is a woman that helped um, like downed pilots escape onto safe land during World War II and the Nightingale was actually a real person. The Rose Code follows these women and other people who worked at this secret intelligence base called Bletchley Park. That was a real thing that worked on intercepting um, messages from the Germans and decoding them so that they could get ahead of all of the movements that the enemy was working on. I just realized that this one has dog hair all over it, but that kind of just is my life. And both of them will absolutely make you sob. So, uh, 
you've been warned. I, I feel like I explained them both pretty succinctly, so I don't need to go into them more, but just know that like both of these are so close to my heart. I loved the Rose Code even more than the Nightingale, and I know that a lot of people rave and rave and love, love, love the Nightingale. So I, I strongly suggest that if you like the Nightingale, please give the Rose Code a chance. So, 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 so good. Now we're taking a turn to romance. So from deep and hard hitting historical to light and fluffy romance, but light, not, not too light and fluffy, light and fluffy minus. For this one I have, if you liked Be Treed, I think you would also like The Summer Job. I picked these two specifically because this is the brand of romance that I really like, where it's kind of disguised as being branded as romance uh, or shelved with romance. But I feel like in the case of both of these, it's really actually more about the self-discovery and the emotional journey and growth of our main female protagonist. In the case of Beach Reed, she's going through um, a lot of grief and a lot of like career stress and is just trying to kind of find her footing in this like very unstable time in her life. And in the case of the summer job, our protagonist is feeling very lost and feels like everyone else in her life has a thing that they know they want to do or that they're really good at or they just have it all figured out and she feels like she got left behind. So she goes to this remote resort to pretend to be her best friend and her best friend is a certified sommelier which is uh, basically like a doctor of wine. You have to go through a crazy amount of studying and schooling to be a certified sommelier. But meanwhile, she actually knows nothing about wine. So she goes and tries to fake her way through Oh God, <laughs> that's my alarm to leave for work. Okay, 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 okay. We're gonna hurry it up. She has to fake her way through knowing about wine while also like trying to form relationships with her new coworkers at the resort and not piss them off. And she realizes that her faking her job is maybe harming the resort as a whole. And she's learning she really likes these people. So both of them have this like, journey and growth aspect to them. Both of them have kind of unlikable um, main characters who are flawed and make a lot of mistakes along the way. So if that's gonna piss you off, then maybe skip them. And that might be why you didn't like Beach Read. I'm just gonna say it. Both of them feature a woman in a new place struggling to find meaning or healing or purpose. Both of them have big major vacation vibes. This is uh, takes place on a beach house in Lake Michigan and in a beach house on Lake Michigan, <laughs> not a pineapple under the sea in Lake Michigan. Whereas, like I mentioned in the summer job, it takes place at this um, beautiful Scottish resort uh, and, and it's just a whole vibe. And they also both get weirdly dark and introspective at certain times. And the romance, I definitely think, is a backseat to the actual character's growth in both cases. So those are my romance wrecks for you, at least for now. <laughs> I'm still experimenting with my romance taste um, and I'm learning it might be a little bit, it might be a little bit dark and a little bit introspective and, and that's fine. This is gonna be a, a fan favorite probably. I have, if you liked The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo, I think that you would also really like City of Girls. I thought it was upside down. <laughs> City of Girls by Elizabeth Gilbert. Both of them are so similar that it baffles me that I've never heard anyone like compare them before. I mean, may maybe it's happened. I mean, I'm not, I'm not all knowing. But the, the main huge similarity is that both of them feature these old seasoned women who have lived big lavish lives telling the story of their lives to a younger person and you don't know why that old woman is telling her story to this specific person until the very end. Pretty similar, except that Evelyn Hugo is an actress in the golden age of Hollywood on the West Coast, while meanwhile, Vivian Morris in City of Girls is living her life in the same time period, but in New York City. Both of them have big party vibes. Both of them are these young women living largely and unapologetically in a time where it was kind of frowned upon for women to be so bold about that kind of thing. In both cases, it feels so real. Like both Vivian and Evelyn Hugo feel, feel like just real people who <laughs> I just read their story, but obviously both of these are fiction works. And both of them get, get really deep at the end. There's definitely a, a big punch at the end for both of them. So 
if, if you, like me, are obsessed with the vibes and the story of Evelyn Hugo, I also think that you would really enjoy City of Girls, and that is the tea. My very last pairing is a, a super fun one because we just read this for the Found in Translation book club. So if you, like me, enjoyed Strange Beasts of China, I think that you would also really like Where the Wild Ladies Are. Uh, both of these are translated short story collections. This one, Strange Beasts of China, follows these mysterious strange beasts, these mysterious beasts that live among humans in China, and the zoologist who goes around collecting information about what makes all of these beasts so strange and unique, and how they are impacting and influencing culture without people necessarily realizing it. Where the Wild Ladies Are is a collection of retellings of Japanese myths and legends with new and recreated feminist endings. So the, the end of this book, like in the glossary or appendix, has the actual myths. So you could see the difference in how the original myths are told versus the way that Ayoko Matsuda rewrites the myths to have a more empowering and haunting message to them. Which actually haunting is like very appropriate because this was super haunting, this was super haunting. Um, where the wild ladies are, a lot of them are like ghosts or spirits or have this paranormal feel to them. Strange Beasts of China also felt very paranormal, even though a lot of them are simply these beasts in China. But uh, yeah, kind of haunting paranormal vibes for sure. But there is this thread of connection through all the stories that kind of builds up and snowballs into this grand realization and and story at the very end of the final story. It's a, it's a really cool storytelling method. Both of them really explore the human experience and like basic human emotions, but really, really get under the skin of them. Both deal with a sense of belonging. I think probably the main thing is they deeply explore the impact that myths and legends can have on a society uh, either on the surface or below the surface. Okay, <laughs> that is all the pairings I have for you today. I actually feel like I could have kept going forever, so if this is something that you enjoyed or you would want to see again, please let me know and I will be happy to put more little pairings together. Um, this was a really fun way to start my day. I definitely think I'm gonna try and continue to pre-film for my work day. I would love to know if you have read any of these books and if you also are feeling the connection between any of these pairings. Do you plan to pick up any of these books? I would love to know. Please tell me all the things. If you want to keep up with me outside of YouTube, you, of course you are welcome to follow me over on Instagram uh, at noelle7pages. And I also have a Storygraph account um, linked below if you would like to keep up with my reading as I update all of the things that I'm currently reading, which right now is a lot, but we will talk about that another day. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. I hope you are well, and I will see you very soon. Love you, bye.